Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is good to unite our hearts together in song, all of us singing the same words at the same time to the same audience. And these songs resonate with us, they resonate with the truths of your word, and so it is good for us to gather. It's good for us to express these things to you, and we're thankful for songwriters. We're thankful for musicians who set the stage for us to offer these expressions of our hearts. We thank you for the book of Psalms, which is this gigantic song book penned by you through real people in real times. And we ask as we look at this psalm tonight that you would be honored, that our hearts truly would be yours, that they would be yours in prayer and dependence and song lifted to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 6 this evening as we make our way through Israel's songbook. We come to the sixth installment. I hope these Psalms strike a chord in your heart. I know they have mine already. There is resonance between the words that we read and situations in our own hearts. In order for you to resonate with Psalm 6, there are really two stipulations. You, you need to have sinned at some point. I think we're good there. And to experience the feelings of the psalm writer as he pens this song, you, you need to have experienced trials of some sort. And I think for most of us, we're there too. If, if you've sinned and you've experienced trials, I think your heart will be able to resonate with this psalm. Sometimes our sin and the trials are very closely linked. We can suffer difficulties because we sinned. Sometimes that linkage is not a straight line. Sometimes we sin, and also, in addition to that, we face trials. That is likely the scenario in the backdrop of this psalm. David is expressing sorrow, a sorrow related to his own sin, and he's also experiencing sorrow as he is beset by trials at the hands of his enemies. And there is a linkage between these things, but it is not a direct linkage. David links these things in his relationship to God. There is an ascription at the top of the psalm. It says, for the choir director with stringed instruments, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. These ascriptions give some instructions, sometimes musical instructions, sometimes they give us the setting or the situation or the author. Here we get to know that David wrote it. We get some musical directions, but, but we don't get any hint from the ascription at the top of the situation in which David penned this song. There's, there's no mention of a historical setting. And this Sheminith is something of a mystery. If you're looking at a New American Standard Bible, you may have something like the eight-stringed lyre. Uh, some believe that this is an instrument with, uh, that comes from a word based on the, on the word eight. And so you have eight strings, perhaps. Uh, some believe that the, the word relates to something at a lower register, that it's fitting a more somber song. There are, there are some songs that are sort of bouncy and light and, and praising. This one is uh, probably slower, darker, more somber. And we can paint the situation of this psalm not from a specific historical setting, but we can derive the situation generally from some of the details in the song. We will discover here sleepless nights, overwhelming sorrow, personal sin, and hostile enemies. They are all in the mix here. I believe David, in writing this song, feels the weight of spiritual sorrow, a spiritual sorrow affecting his physical condition. And it is a sorrow linked to his own sin, though no specific sins are mentioned by David. And at the same time, David is being harassed by enemies. And so the psalm portrays some correlation between David's personal sin, 
his view of God's response to his sin, and the hostility of his enemies. David seems to link spiritual sorrow and trouble from his enemies to God's corrective discipline. David's a sinner. He's being hounded by enemies. Is this God's discipline in my life? That seems to be the link. And it's not so much that David is being persecuted by enemies because of something bad he did to them. That's not really a good definition of persecution, is it? I hit you, you hit me back. I'm being persecuted. I'm being persecuted by the police. Never mind that I was doing 120 miles an hour in a school zone and I did not stop. But they're flashing their lights at me and they put out spike strips and ruined my tires. You may say, I'm being persecuted by the IRS. They just won't leave me alone. Never mind that I haven't filed for 14 years. That's not persecution. That's just consequence. But here in this psalm, we have persecution unrelated to David's sin, but related in David's mind to his vertical relationship to God. In David's case, there's no evidence for the direct linkage, which means that it is possible to be innocent in a matter and yet not innocent absolutely. David was a sinner. He did some terrible things. But I can guarantee you that David had no part in JFK's assassination. He's innocent in the matter. That doesn't mean he's an innocent man. It doesn't mean that he's sinless. But he he has nothing to do with a particular crime. In this psalm, David is overwhelmed by sorrow. And he is being mistreated. And his song is a prayer for help. To outline this psalm, we'll just ask the question, what should a sinner do when harassed by enemies? And let's just pull apart the question for a moment. What should a sinner do when harassed by enemies? A sinner, meaning you're aware of your own sin. And you're being harassed by people you did not sin against. What should you do? Open Psalm 6 and sing it, I think is the answer. Uh, We're going to look at this in two parts. Pray for grace in divine correction and trust in God for eventual relief. There are two major parts to this psalm, and and the first one is a prayer for grace in God's correction in your life. And the second part is an expression of trust in God that relief is coming eventually. Let's look at that first part. The first part covers the first seven verses. And if you and I are sinners harassed by enemies, we should pray for grace in divine correction. Let's read the whole psalm. I want you to feel the turn that comes after verse 7, and then we'll look at the first part and then the second part. David sings, O Yahweh, do not reprove me in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Yahweh, for I am pining away. Heal me, O Yahweh, for my bones are dismayed. My soul is greatly dismayed. But you, O Yahweh, how long? Return, O Yahweh, rescue my soul. Save me because of your loving kindness. For there is no remembrance of you in death. In Sheol, who will give you thanks? I am weary with my sighing. Every night I make my bed swim. I flood my couch with tears. My eye has wasted away with grief. It has become old because of all my adversaries. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. For Yahweh has heard the sound of my weeping. Yahweh has heard my supplication. Yahweh receives my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and greatly dismayed. They shall turn back and they will suddenly be ashamed. The first section of this psalm, the the prayer for grace in divine correction, can be subdivided in a a number of sections. And and the first is a request for grace, a request for grace. And we see this in the first two verses. David says, O Yahweh, do not reprove me in your anger, nor discipline, discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Yahweh. And the name Yahweh appears five times in four verses. It's a a startling use of the divine name in in a very compact way. It's an appeal to God's covenant-keeping love. 
Yahweh is his name. Elohim, or God, is his title. When the name is used, it is an appeal to his self-existence and the fact that he keeps his promises. And so David appeals to Yahweh on the basis of his character through the divine name. And he says in verse 1, Do not rebuke me in anger, and do not chasten or discipline me in your wrath. And, and the word for wrath here is a, a word used for white hot heat or for poison. And, and this is an interesting appeal. Uh, David does not say, don't reprove me. He doesn't say, don't discipline me. No chastisement. He says, don't reprove me in anger. Don't discipline me in that white hot wrath. You see, discipline and reproof from God are good. And David here, even in the way he asks the question, recognizes the need of correction. Proverbs 3.12 says, For whom Yahweh loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. The New Testament affirms this same reality in the book of Hebrews, that if you are not receiving loving correction from God, you are no true son. It's actually a mark of your sonship, that God in love brings correction and reproof into your life. David knows this, and so he doesn't say, God, stop reproving me. Get off my back. He says, let your reproof not be in that anger reserved for those you don't love. God's loving correction is a grace, but God's white-hot wrath or the anger of his unflinching judgment, none could stand that. So David prays, be gracious to me. It's a request that God would be favorably inclined toward David. It's a, God, be merciful to me. This very request reveals to us that David is sensitive to his own sin. It is at least a part of the cause of the sorrow that brings about this psalm, this prayer. And after a request for grace, David gives, in verses 2 and 3, a description of his suffering. A description of his suffering. Look at verse 2, in the, the second half. He says, for I am pining away. And then he says, heal me, O Yahweh, for my bones are dismayed, and my soul is greatly dismayed. But you, O Yahweh, how long? He says in this description of suffering, I am pining away. It's a way of describing weakness. The word here is a word used of withering plants. And if you've looked at your backyard recently, in these last weeks of a late Arizona summer, that is slowly sapping life from every green plant on your property, you understand the picture of David's state. He's withering. And he cries out, heal me, Yahweh. And he describes it this way, for my bones are dismayed. They're disturbed. They are terrified. And the bones in your physical body are the solid structures of your body. And when the bones feel like jello, this is a way to express a, a deep intensity to, dis, to depression. There is an instability here, a, a body racked with spiritual anguish. He then says in verse 3, my soul is greatly dismayed. He just described his, his bones as being dismayed. The, the, the very deep inward solid parts of him are not feeling so solid. And, and like the feeling deep in his bones, he describes the totality of his inner man as having become dismayed, disturbed, a, a word that, that is sometimes translated terrified. David here has thoroughly lost heart. This affliction seems too much for him. And verse 3 ends with an incomplete thought. And in its very incompleteness, it conveys the anguish of his soul. Literally, it reads, but you, Yahweh, how long? How long what? He doesn't say. The, the implication is how long until deliverance? How long until healing? How long until there is a solid state to my soul and, and my physical frame? This refrain, how long, O Yahweh, will show up again and again and again in the Psalms. Uh, 
It is a way to express the faith and the tension of life in this world. We are troubled. Things are not as they should be. And we trust to God. He's the only one we could call to. And we cry out, how long, O Lord? After the description of suffering, there is a basis for this prayer. The basis for this prayer. It's found in verse 4. Look down at that verse. David says, return, O Yahweh, rescue my soul. Save me because of your loving kindness. Verse 4 happens to be right in the middle of this first section. The first seven verses. Verse 4 right in the center. It stands out significantly. And what stands out right in the middle of this section of the psalm is God's covenant love. This is the familiar word, loving kindness. It's the Old Testament word for grace. It's the word for undeserved favor of the expression of God's covenant love given to people who don't deserve it. And verse 4's place right in the middle of this first section makes God's grace stand out as the center of thought for prayer. David's prayer for grace in divine correction. David here in verse 4 reveals the basis of his prayer. It is an appeal to the characteristic covenant love of God towards his people. It's just a great way to pray. Rescue my soul, he says, because of your grace. On the basis of your loving kindness. David is not appealing to what he deserves. He doesn't appeal to merit, nor to his own righteousness. He appeals to grace. After giving the basis of this prayer, David moves on to a reason for rescue. A reason for rescue. Look at verse 5. For there is no remembrance of you in death. In Sheol, who will give you thanks? The the reason for rescue that David appeals to here is a, a reason of public testimony. Remembrance here. It's not just sort of the mental recalling of ideas. It is giving public testimony to all that God has done. Who will remember you from the grave? He talks here about literally a throwing up of thanksgiving. Who will throw up thanks to you from Sheol? And the Hebrew word Sheol is, a, is sort of an all-encompassing word that de- describes life after death. It, it's not so much about a destination. It's a earthly perspective way of describing the grave. Sheol is is not a location. It's not a place. Uh, It's more of the terminus of this life. And and the righteous are said to depart for Sheol. And and even the Old Testament understanding of that is presence with the Lord. We'll get there in Psalm 16. The wicked are also said to go to Sheol. It doesn't mean they go to heaven. It just means they go to the grave. They go to death. And, of course, their location after terminus of this life is in judgment under God. Sheol, this general word here, is used in parallel with the, with the word for death. There's no remembrance of you in death. In Sheol, who will give you thanks? And the idea here is that one can praise God publicly for his deliverances... One can give testimony before a watching world, the the great graces of God in one's life, only while you are in this world. If David has in mind physical death here, then of course he will render testimony and thanksgiving in heaven in the presence of God, though he would cease to be able to do so here in the presence of men. His appeal is, I'd love to go on giving praise to you, God, here on this earth, to people who could hear about it and and praise you for it and and trust you as a result. But if David's concern here is a little more dire, and maybe your own soul has been troubled this way, what if my sins have separated me from my God forever? Forever? Have you ever had those thoughts? Have I sinned my way out of grace? Am I even a a believer? Listen, when, when we get so tangled up in sin that we lose sight of grace, 
we lose our assurance of salvation, that doesn't affect eternal security. Those who belong to Christ belong to Christ and can never be separated. But sin is blinding and confusing. Sometimes a Unbroken sin reveals someone who was never born again and had no right to assurance of salvation. And sometimes we lose our assurance because we need to do battle with sin and we need to get on short accounts with God and we need to get a tender conscience all over again. If David's concern in this psalm is is of that more dire sense... What if my sins have separated me from God? An awful thought. Then his words here take on even more urgency. If I were to die today under your white hot wrath, under your angry judgment over my sin, if I walked into eternity without my sins paid for, taken care of, then I would be facing not just physical death, but spiritual death as well separated forever from your goodness and and the fullness of joy that you promise in your presence. And there, in that state of eternal judgment, there will be no praise of God and there will be no thanksgiving thrown up from there. Whatever the case may be, if David is thinking, well, absent from the body, present with the Lord, but if I die, I can't give thanks to the people here on earth. Or, my soul is in such turmoil, I don't know where I'm going. (laughs) Whichever case it is, David's thoughts here have clearly gone terminal. He is thinking about end of life. He's thinking about the end of the line. He's he's considering this may be it. I, I may be going to the grave. God save me. How sorrowful must he be? How physically weak has he become? And he moves next in verses 6 and 7 to an expression of sorrow. An expression of sorrow. Look down at these verses. He says, I am weary with my sighing. Every night I make my bed swim. I flood my couch with my tears. My eye has wasted away with grief. It has become old because of all my adversaries. This expression of sorrow is is dramatic and picturesque. He begins by saying, I'm weary of my sighing. He He's awake and sighing, but he's tired. These are sleepless nights. It's like he's tired of being tired. He's sorry about being so sorrowful. He he says, I make my bed swim every night. It's a dramatic picture of, of the sorrow he's experiencing. In a parallel way, he says... I flood my couch with my tears. New American Standard Bible says, I I dissolve my couch with my tears. And the word for dissolve here is a a Hebrew word that just means to liquefy. The place where David sleeps is, is just a pool of his tears. And he paints a picture like a paper straw and a tall drink. My bed doesn't stand a chance against my sorrows. It dissolves beneath me. This is dramatic language. I don't know if because of sorrows, either from sin or from trials, related or unrelated, you've, you've encountered sleepless nights. The kind of sorrow that, that consumes your thoughts and, and wakes you up through the night. and Constant tears. And look at verse 7. He says, my eye has wasted away with grief. Literally, it's the, the word for wasting away is advancing in age, growing old. He says, I can't see straight on account of grief, a word for vexation. He says, my eyesight's going like an old man. And listen, at this point in David's life, it's not the years, it's the mileage. And verse 7 gives us a significant clue into David's mindset. Look at the end of verse 7. My eye has become old because of all my adversaries. Here, David gives an an underlying cause to this depth of sorrow. He's linked his sorrow here, both to his own sin at the beginning of the psalm, but, but now also to his enemies. This is a sorrow compounded. 
And then between verses 7 and 8, you probably have a new paragraph marker in, in verse 8. Sometimes our English Bibles indicate that with a bold number. Do you see a space there or a bold number, new paragraph? That's an appropriate division. And between verses 7 and 8, there is a turn a rather dramatic shift. And maybe as I read the psalm in the beginning, you felt that shift. Maybe you asked, are we singing the same song? What just happened here? (laughs) David was sorry, overwhelmed by sorrow, and then he's talking to his enemies. There is a shift here. He has moved from vexation and sorrow to confident faith. And this is a very common feature in the psalms. Many of the Psalms are constructed this way, and and we ought to keep our eyes open for the turn. What's happening in the turn? The the psalmist, as the psalmist is composing the the lyric, is coming to truth. We might say shepherding his own heart, or, or preaching the truth to himself, or talking to himself more than he's listening to his own thoughts. And the turn in the Psalms that happens over and over and over again throughout the songbook is very instructive for us. God wants to hear our prayers. It is good for us to express our laments and our our sorrow and our penitential expressions over our sin. It's good to ask for relief. It's good to ask, how long, O Lord? But the turn happens when we trust God and his character and his love and his purposes. And in Psalms like this, his timing. And what happens between verses 7 and 8 is eschatology applied. Taking the long view. Looking at the end of things. And and you must know the, the situation David is facing doesn't get solved between verse 7 and 8. What gets altered? Do do his enemies stop hounding him? Uh, Does he all of a sudden enter some sinless perfection, second work of grace? No, his situation hasn't changed at all. David has been altered. His perspective has been altered. His faith has been strengthened. So look down at verse 8 and and read this last section. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. He sings, for Yahweh has heard the sound of my weeping. Yahweh has heard my supplication. Yahweh receives my prayer. All my enemies, notice this detail, will be ashamed, will be greatly dismayed. They shall turn back. They shall suddenly be ashamed. Yahweh has heard me. And something will happen as a result in the future. Notice in verse 8, Yahweh has heard the voice of my weeping. Verse 9, Yahweh has heard my supplication. Verse 9, Yahweh receives my prayer. These are confident assertions of trust, of faith in a prayer hearing God. And here in the turn, David has renewed strength, a confidence that he has been heard, a trust in victory and in vindication. And in this turn, the the song takes a new tone as he utters an an admonition to those wicked enemies who are persecuting him. And he says, depart from me, you who do iniquity. And then he gives the reason. For Yahweh has heard the sound of my weeping. And the weeping here connects us back to the first part of the verse. We we are still in the same song. (laughs) David was weeping, Yahweh heard it, so depart from me, workers of iniquity. This is maybe an admonition, maybe a warning. It might be like the kind of thing you you heard from your little sister when you were misbehaving and and she said, I'm going to tell mom. Does it stop you in your tracks if mom is going to find out? And then, of course, mom said something like, just wait till your father gets home. When your father hears what you've done, maybe you've given those speeches or heard those speeches or seen them on a television program. That strikes fear into the heart. Maybe it stops the worker of iniquity in his tracks that someone besides the person I'm picking on heard, heard the complaint Someone big and strong 
heard the cry for help and is going to come to the rescue, and now I'm in trouble. David's expression is an expression of trust. An expression of trust in God that God will do what is right in the end. That adversaries are in the hand of God. They may not know it. David knows it. And it gives him confidence that he has been heard, that God will do what is right, and that the end of those adversaries is accountability. Every one of them will be held accountable by God for their treatment of his children. Look down at verse 10. All my enemies will be ashamed. All my enemies will be greatly dismayed. They shall turn back. They will suddenly be ashamed. Four lines in this last stanza of the song. And in each of these, language from the earlier portion of the song is now employed to describe the fate of David's enemies. And it's so interesting. David takes the vocabulary from the first part and turns it so that we see it applied to enemies. So there's a a turn in the psalm between verses 7 and 8. There's a turn in David's heart from overwhelming sorrow and angst to confident trust. And then there's even a turn in the words from the first half to the second half. The enemies who sought to bring shame to David will themselves be ashamed. The the enemies will be greatly dismayed. Remember, David said his bones were dismayed and his soul was dismayed. The last portion tells us the enemies will turn back. And we read that Yahweh turned to hear David's prayer. The last two words in Hebrew are actually a reverse of each other in their spelling. You can't see it in English, but it's a very poetic way to illustrate the turn that has happened. Notice the last phrase. They will suddenly be ashamed. They will suddenly be ashamed. Again, this is a confidence in God's plan. It's still yet future. David's situation hasn't changed. His heart has changed. He trusts the Lord. God will do what is right. But this is still outstanding. And what's outstanding is a catastrophic, unexpected, sudden shame that will engulf the enemies of God. The enemies of God who have made themselves the enemies of God's people. Daniel 12.2 describes this shame as happening at the resurrection of judgment. He says, There are those who sleep in the dust of the ground that will awake, many of them to everlasting life. But the others who sleep in the dust of the ground will also awake, and they will awake to disgrace and everlasting contempt. This is the biblical doctrine of eternal conscious torment. Or hell, the the, the final place of the condemned wicked is the lake of fire. If you and I were to contemplate for just a few moments what that lake of fire is like, what, what the eternal shame will be like. What what will it be like to never have a changed heart, to never be repentant, to never be grateful to God, to never experience the joy of knowing God and experiencing His goodness and love, but forever to wither in your wickedness and to suffer the consequences of divine judgment for it with no relief, with no repentance, no second chance, No hope of escape. This phrase, they will suddenly be ashamed, is heavy. It's weighty. It it comes with the weight of all that the Bible says about eternal judgment. God is right to judge. In fact, the New Testament affirms the judgment of God against the enemies of God's people in a very similar scenario that David paints in this psalm. Listen to the words of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. A plain indication of God's righteous judgment 
so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. After all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all those who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling, fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. There the Apostle Paul is writing to believers who are suffering under the hand of enemies who are persecuting them and God affirms that he will be just in bringing affliction on them for their having afflicted you. That is a comfort for the believer in times of persecution under enemies that God will take care of things. He will be just. He will do what is right. Eschatology clears the senses like a spoonful of wasabi. All of a sudden, I can see clearly. I got a dose of the long view. I can have confident trust in my God. I will not be afflicted forever. God will turn my tears to joy. God will turn their triumphant evil into just punishment. Listen, God loves his children. And if there is a linkage in your life between suffering and your own sin, even if that linkage is not direct, maybe it's something like David's in this psalm. He, he's aware of his own sin before the Lord, and he's being persecuted for something unrelated. It's good for us to remember that God loves his children and God brings loving discipline in your life. And the discipline he brings often comes by means, by implements, by tools in his hands. And those tools do not intend your good. They might intend it for evil. God intends it for good. Think about Habakkuk chapter 1. You can turn there for a moment. We just went through the 66 book series on Sunday nights, so we should all be finding Habakkuk easily. I didn't. But it is on page 1,259 in my Bible. And Habakkuk cries out, How long, O Yahweh? Does that sound familiar? How long will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see wickedness and cause me to look on trouble? Indeed, devastation and violence are before me and there is strife and contention is lifted up. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice never comes forth. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes forth perverted. God says, see among the nations and look, be astonished, be astounded. I am doing something in your days. You wouldn't believe it if I recounted it to you. Behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, uh, the, the evil, wicked nation sponsored by Satan that tortures its enemy victims by skinning them alive and stringing them up on the walls of their buildings. It's an empire that is chewing up rival empires one by one as it goes across the land dominating the world. And, and do you know what they're going to do? They're going to come to Jerusalem. They're going to come to Israel. By my hand, says God. 
And Habakkuk's response is, oh, no, no, God, you're holy. You're, you're too pure to look on evil. Habakkuk's right that God is holy and he's pure, but it does not defame his holy character to employ implements, even wicked ones, to accomplish his good purposes. In this case, to bring about an attention-getting purification to the people he loves, to the nation he has called to be his own. And listen, you need to understand, there are good purposes from God in the Babylonian invasion of Israel. But the Babylonians don't intend it that way. They just want to take over stuff. They want to pillage and plunder. They want to murder. They want to conquer the world for their own pride. Babylonians don't intend it for good, but God does. Romans 8.28, we know that God causes all things together to work together for good. The things themselves may not intend your good, but God does. In James 1, we learn that trials bring about good. They bring about Christian maturity, the, the very thing that you want. But the trials themselves don't have a mind that says, do you know, I want that Christian's good, so I'm just going to be difficult. And that's going to bring about perseverance, and that's going to bring about completeness, perfection, maturity in the Christian life. Because, you know, I just love that Christian. I want him to be like Christ. I want to be an answer to his prayer. That's not how a trial thinks. That's not how a Chaldean army thinks. That's not how all things think. So if you're experiencing difficulty, you know you're not getting everything you deserve in terms of a, an appropriate justice for the sins you've committed against God. You may be thinking, well, the things that are going on in my life that are difficult are not related to particular sins. But as a matter of using Psalm 6 to shepherd your own heart, it's good to ask the question, does God want my attention? Would God like for me to pause, be arrested in my busyness of life, and stop and think for a moment? God, what do you want me to learn? What do you have for me in this? I'm not as Christ-like as I ought to be. I'm not a finished product. I'm, I'm under construction. Is there something that I need to put my eyes on, some area of my life that I'm not seeing? That's a good question to ask. And listen, we don't know the answer to that question. Our trials are arresting. They're attention getters. It's a good opportunity to evaluate our lives and look for areas to grow in Christ's likeness. We don't always know what God is up to. We live in a troubled world. Sometimes things are just hard. Things are just broken. Trials are designed by God to help us be homesick for our permanent residence. That may be the only reason for difficulty in your life. Hey, I don't belong here. Can't wait to get home. But sometimes difficulties unrelated to our sins are used by God as fatherly discipline to get us to ask the question, do I need to pay attention to something in my life? God's good in this. Even if there's no connection between our sins before God and the trials we're facing, we ought to be eager for loving correction, even as we pray for relief. And we can make the turn. We can make the turn between verse 7 and verse 8, where we go from dissolving our bed with our tears to confident trust that God will set everything right. He will remove every difficulty. That day's coming. David's situation in the psalm doesn't change, but his faith did, and we need that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this song. Like the other songs in this book, it is instructive for us. We are instructed by you, through David, a man who faced severe trials and turned to you in a cry for help. And by the superintending work of your spirit, he, he put these thoughts to lyric so that the world might sing them.
Lord, thank you for this record that allows us to enter in and appreciate and resonate with this cry for help. We ask the question, who is against us? We, we might name our sins. We might think you're against us. We might think that enemies are against us. But we know from your word that if you are for us, nothing can be against us. Nothing can stand. Not our sins paid for by the blood of your son and not our enemies who will face the accountability of reckoning before you one day. So we are eternally grateful, God, that you are indeed on our side and that you love us, all who are in your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.